Just under three years before the sinking of the RMS Titanic, another ship which would go down in history and become later known as Australia's Titanic was making her way along the coast of Africa when she vanished without a trace. She took all 211 crew and passengers with her and none have ever been seen again. Not even a trace has ever been found. In fact, they disappeared so utterly that not even a single life belt or piece of debris was ever found. And the only passenger who was spared this fate was only spared because of a chilling warning he experienced in the form of a dream while on board this doomed ship prior to the leg of the voyage she vanished on. Over a century later, and she is still missing. This story is simply and utterly baffling. Many searches have been commenced since she vanished. One individual named Emlyn Brown even spent 22 years searching for her wreck in the area she was last known to be in, but found nothing. The ship was utterly gone without a single trace, and to this day, her fate remains unknown, as do the fates of the 211 people who were in her care and vanished with her. Today, I will tell you the story of this ship, the SS Waratah, and the mystery that has gone unsolved for over a century. We will be covering the history of the ship, her last voyage and disappearance, and the theories about what happened to her, just in time for the anniversary of her disappearance. If you enjoy documentary content along these lines, please like and subscribe so that I know you want to see more of it. And if you enjoy ocean-related mysteries, check out my videos on some real-life sea monsters and other missing ships. I'll link some in the description. I've also narrated original stories that I've written, including my own retelling of the Orang Madan and Philadelphia Experiment Legends, and they will also be linked below, so please check them out if you're interested. And one final thing, this is a remastering of an older video that I'm doing for the anniversary of Waratah's disappearance. This remaster includes not only a brand new audio track, but a few details of the story I left out of the original version, and a few corrected details as well. So if you've seen the original, there's going to be some new details added to this version, as well as a bunch of photos of the Waratah I didn't use in the original. Okay, with all that covered, let's start the story. We'll begin with the history of the ship itself. Waratah, constructed from 1907 to 1908, was 465 feet long. She was a new cargo and passenger vessel for the Blue Anchor Line and completed her sea trials in 1908. She also passed all inspections from her builders, owners, the Board of Trade, and Lloyds of London. The original order for the ship was placed in September 1909 with a 12-month construction period. The Wartal was laid down and launched in September 1908, a year after the order had been placed. Wartal's sister ship was the SS Geelong. In August 1909, Geelong would actually be among the ships searching the ocean for the vanished Waratah. Sadly, Geelong wouldn't last forever either. She would be sunk in the Mediterranean in January 1916, just under seven years after the Waratah would vanish. I bring the Geelong up for an additional reason. Because when the Waratah was designed, she was being designed to be an improved version of the already existing Geelong, which launched in 1904. So most of her specifications were based on the Geelong. Waratah was able to move at a speed of 13.5 knots on average, while the Geelong could average a speed of 12, though she could push herself to 14 if need be. Waratah had a crew of 154 on average, 423 passenger cabins, along with an additional 600 spaces for temporary dormitories in the holds, and lifeboat and raft space for 921 people. Remember, this was before the sinking of the Titanic, so the issue of there not being enough lifeboats wasn't really a mainstream issue at this point. She cost 139,900 pounds to build. Her captain was Joshua Edward Ilbury, who had been the captain of Waratah's sister ship. Waratah also had no wireless set, meaning that if she became distressed at sea, she would be on her own and have no way to contact land. While the Waratah was on her maiden voyage in 1908, it was reported by her second officer that there was a fire in the lower starboard bunker that extended all the way to the engine room. It was brought under control by noon that day, but continued to reignite for the next four days until December 10th. Fires in coal bunkers, though, wasn't the most uncommon thing back then. An uninsulated steam valve was found to be the cause of the fires, and repairs were done in Sydney under the supervision of the chief, and they were done to his satisfaction. From there, the Waratah made a few more trips until arriving in London again in March 1909 to finalize her maiden voyage. 
One passenger who sailed on the Waratah commented many years later on how friendly the crew had been on the voyage and how nice they treated the passengers. I wish I could track down more first-hand accounts of people who sailed on the ship, but they seem to be few and far between. Warta unloaded her cargo after returning to London and was put in dry dock for inspection and underwent a few minor repairs at the time. The captain and crew of the Warta used this opportunity to criticize the ship for her stability and handling. The captain even saying bluntly that the ship was not as stable as his previous vessel. These comments caused some heated words to be exchanged between the ship's owners and the ship's builders. The Waratah's second voyage wasn't delayed though, but the owners and builders intended to work on a solution to the stability issues while the Waratah was away. On April 29, 1909, only a few months before she would disappear, the Waratah set out on her second trip to Australia. She was carrying 139 steerage passengers on this trip, along with 22 cabin passengers, a crew of 119, and a large cargo. The trip was uneventful, and the steamer arrived on June 6, after roughly a three-week trip. At port, the ship unloaded around 970 tons of lead ore and then continued on down to Melbourne. And then on this leg of the trip, she had to plow her way through a strong gale, which complicated her berthing on her arrival at June 11th. From there, the ship then continued down to Sydney. Once she arrived, she loaded her new cargo for the return trip. Once the cargo was loaded, which consisted of flour, wool, dairy, frozen meat, and 7,800 bars of bullion, she left port on June 26 and made a few more stops before arriving in Durban. This leg of the trip also had around 100 passengers, as well as a convict who was being extradited to a Transvaal colony, along with his escort of two Transvaal policemen. Fun fact. While in Durban, one Claude G. Sawyer, an experienced sea traveler and engineer, had felt nervous about the behavior of the ship during his voyage, and had even experienced a premonition in dreams that he saw as a warning to leave the ship. In those dreams, he saw a figure rising out of the ocean, holding a sword out towards the Waratah, and holding a bloody rag in their other hand, and the figure reportedly shouted, Waratah! 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 He sent a telegram to his wife in London, saying that the ship had arrived in Durban and that he felt she was top-heavy and he left the vessel while it was in Durban. His dreams proved indeed to be a premonition, or maybe even a warning from some higher power for the more spiritual out there. The Waratah would vanish after leaving port, and the decision to leave the ship early saved Sawyer's life. Had he stayed on, the number of missing would be 212. At 8.15 p.m. on July 26, 1909, the Wartal left Durban. She had 211 passengers and crew on board. On July 27, at 4 a.m., she was spotted astern by the steamer Clan McIntyre, and as the Wartal was the faster ship, she gradually came level with the Clan McIntyre by 6 a.m., and the two ships communicated with each other via their signal lamps. All was well. The two ships shared who they were and what their destinations were, general information that was customary to share. Wartal then overtook the Clan McIntyre, near the southeast coast of the Banshee River. Clan McIntyre would lose sight of the Waratah when she passed over the horizon at 9.30 a.m. that morning. This was the last confirmed time that the ship was ever seen. Other unconfirmed sightings did occur over the next few days, and we will cover them later in this video. For now, though, let's carry on with the events that followed the last confirmed sighting. Later that day, the weather took a turn for the worst. Experienced captains even called it the worst they'd ever seen. The captain of the Clan McIntyre even said it was the worst he'd seen in 13 years of sea experience. The strong winds and high seas are not uncommon in the region, and the swell even developed into a hurricane by July 28th. Since the Waratah was considered unsinkable, man, we really have got to stop calling ships that, and since it wasn't uncommon at the time for ships to sometimes be weeks overdue, and the ship didn't arrive on schedule, no one batted an eye. The absolute worst case scenario people initially thought was that she'd had a mechanical problem and broken down and was adrift. However, fears for her safety and the safety of her passengers and crew began to grow when other ships traveling the same route reported no sign of her on the entire length of the voyage. The 1st of August 1909 saw the first search effort when the tugboat T.E. Fuller was sent out to try and locate the Waratah. The search was abandoned when the weather again turned poor. 
Royal Navy cruisers, HMS Pandora and HMS Fort, along with later the HMS Hermes, were deployed to search for the Waratah, with Hermes specifically focusing on the last place the ship was confirmed to have been sighted. Nothing was found. Hermes encountered waves in the region where the Waratah vanished, so massive that she was heavily damaged and had to be put into dry dock for repairs. Numerous additional ships joined the search. Remember earlier I mentioned that the Warta sister ship Geelong was among them. The German steamship Goslar even kept a special watch specifically for the Warta for 1,262 miles of ocean. Still nothing. One ship, whose name I'm going to put on screen because I'm going to butcher this, the Insazawa, sure, reported spotting bodies near where the Warta was last sighted but they turned out to merely be dead stakes. Hmm, look at that. Dead stakes showed up in my Loch Ness Monster video, and here they are again too. Someone make a conspiracy theory about why dead stakes seem to be around scenarios with mysterious circumstances at play. Despite all the ships looking, and the utter lack of any sign of Warta or any wreckage of Warta, as August continued, hope remained that the ship was still afloat somewhere, Warta had enough provisions on board to last over one a year, so even if she drifted hundreds of miles off course, they would still be alive. But due to the lack of her wireless set, it would be impossible for the ship to communicate unless another vessel passed near enough for visual communication to be established. Sometimes ships got lucky enough and this did occur. The passenger liner California did in 1881, but the Warta was not so lucky. On December 15, 1909, with no sightings of Warta for over four months, she was officially labeled as missing at Lloyd's of London. In early 1910, family members of passengers on the Warta came together and charted their own rescue mission, hiring the ship Wakefield, which conducted a 15,000 mile or 24,000 kilometer search over a period of four months. Again, nothing was found. As the years began to pass, Occasional scattered reports of wreckage being found would pop up. Rumors of a life preserver marked Waratah washing up in New Zealand cropped up in 1912. In 1925, Lieutenant D.J. Roos of the South African Air Force said he'd spotted a wreck which matched the Waratah while flying over the coastline. Timbers, possibly from the Waratah, also washed ashore in East London in 1939. However, Keep in mind that with previous instances of ships vanishing without a trace, it's not uncommon for false artifacts to wash up months or even years later. Check out the story of the SS City of Boston for an example of this kind of hoax. Back then, all the rage seemed to be making fake messages and bottles from ships which vanished and letting people find them. As far as I know, the only thing like that that has been considered legitimate came in the case of the SS Pacific. Point is... None of these stories of items from the Waratah have ever been confirmed and should not be treated as any kind of proof of the ship's fate. Modern searches have had no better luck when it comes to finding any trace of the Waratah. I mentioned Emblem Brown at the start of the video. He spent 22 years searching for the Waratah from the early 1980s to 2004. In 1999, he thought he'd found the ship while working alongside the National Underwater and Marine Agency and author Clive Cussler. And newspapers reported that the wreck was found off the eastern coast of South Africa, resting on the sea for 10 kilometers out to sea. I tracked down one such article and will read a bit from it. It was published on July 14, 1999, and is titled, Waratah Found Off Transky Coast. Quote, An 18-year search for one of South Africa's most famous vessels, the SS Waratah, has come to an end. Her wreck was found off the eastern seaboard of the Transkey Coast in June, and maritime explorer Emblem Brown said on Wednesday. It was his ninth expedition since 1983 to find the wreck of the luxury liner, which sank with its 211 crew and passengers after leaving Durban on July 26, 1909. Cape Mountain soldier Edward Joe Conker said at the time he saw the ship roll over and sink. Brown said he kept his latest expedition under wraps, as he could not face the public if he had miscalculated the ship's position. Brown, who heads the National Underwater and Marine Agency in South Africa, said, 
The wreck is lying upright on the seafloor at a depth of 113 meters with its bow facing a northeasterly direction. The forward section of the vessel was extensively damaged on the impact with the seafloor and the effect of the current acting on her for 90 years. Brown said he kept his latest expedition under wraps as he could not face the public in the event of having miscalculated the ship's position. She is an extraordinary sight. She appears so tragic, just sleeping in silence on the seabed, Brown said. End quote. A sonar scan showed a wrecked ship, which seemed to match the lost SS Waratah, and there was great excitement that the mystery had been solved. Unfortunately, it was not meant to be. A dive to the site in 2001 revealed that the wreck had been wrongly identified as the Waratah, and the wreck was actually that of the SS Nail Sea Meadow, a ship sunk during World War II. On May 8, 1943, the SS Nail Sea Meadow had left Cape Town for Bombay. During this trip on May 11th, she was torpedoed by German submarine U-196. And after looking up a picture of her, I can see how she could be misidentified as the Warta, especially just from a sonar image. They look very similar to each other. They have a very similar shape. In 2004, Emlyn Brown declared that after 22 years of searching, he was giving up. He said, quote, I've exhausted all the options. I now have no idea where to look. I'd love to see a map with all the places he looked marked. I'm very curious just how many places we now know Warta isn't. If anything good comes from knowing that, it's that it's one step closer to finding where she is. Hopefully one day, someone picks the search back up. As I mentioned earlier, unconfirmed sightings from July in the days after the last confirmed sighting of Warata came up too. If any of these are valid remains unknown, but here is each known one. I'll let you make up your own mind. First comes from the ship Harlow on July 27, 1909. Remember that the Warata left German on July 26th, and the last confirmed sighting of her was on the morning of July 29, and she was expected to reach Cape Town on July 29th. This possible sighting by the Harlow occurred on the evening of July 27th at 5.30 p.m., 17.30 hours. They saw the smoke of a steamer on the horizon, and the smoke was so thick that the captain of the Harlow wondered if this mysterious steamer was on fire. After darkness fell, they saw the steamer's running lights approaching them, still 10 to 12 miles back. Suddenly, there was two bright flashes, but no sound heard due to the distance and the lights vanished. The Harlow captain thought the steamer had exploded, but his mate convinced him that it was just brush fires on the shore, a common thing that occurs. The captain agreed with his mate, and opted not to record the incident in the log, and only thought back on the incident as being significant after he learned that the Waratah had vanished. According to the captain of the Harlow, the ship was around 180 miles or 290 kilometers from Durban when the incident occurred. Keep this story in mind as it will come back up later in the video. Exactly four hours later on the same evening, the Union Castle liner, the Gilf, which was traveling north from the Cape of Good Hope, passed an unknown ship and they exchanged signals by the signal lamps. But due to the rough seas and bad weather, they only made out the last three letters of the passing ship's name. Those letters apparently were T-A-H. In my opinion, out of all of the unconfirmed sightings and my own theory of the timeline of all this, I think this one probably was an actual sighting of the Waratah. It can't be confirmed, but that's my opinion. I think that this was the actual last sighting of the ship. I'll get into why when I cover my own theory. Another sighting was not reported until 1929. This is the one that was mentioned in the news article a minute ago. And... I don't really know if I believe this one personally. Eyewitness testimony is, of course, the least reliable form of evidence. People can just say whatever they want and claim whatever they want to be true. So, again, I'll let you make up your own mind. This, is, this was the story reported by Edward Joe Conker that the article mentioned. He was a cape-mounted rifleman. According to him, on July 28, 1909, he observed through a telescope while conducting a military exercise at the mouth of the Zora River a, a steamship which looked like the Waratah struggling slowly through the rough seas, heading southwest. 
He watched as the ship rolled heavily in the rough seas before, while already partially rolled over, a powerful wave struck her, swamped her, and caused her to roll over and quickly vanish from view. According to Conker, his orderly sergeant did not take the matter seriously, and as a result, he never came forward with his story until 1929. The story is definitely possible, and it is in line with one of the theories about what caused Waratah to vanish. But remember, eyewitness testimony is the least reliable form of evidence. So I'll leave you with the story and let you make up your own mind on whether you believe Conquer or not. So with the last confirmed sighting by the Clan McIntyre, when the weather changed, and all these unconfirmed stories in mind, I'd say that whatever happened to the Waratah probably occurred on July 28th. Before we cover the theories about why Waratah disappeared, it's worth mentioning what happened because she disappeared. Blue Anchor Line's ticket sales for their liners dropped severely, and the criticism directed towards the company did not help either. The loss of the sales, the huge financial loss of Waratah, and other factors all forced the company to sell many of its ships and voluntarily liquidate itself beginning in 1910. In this section, we are going to cover each of the main theories about the fate of the Waratah. After we go through each one, tell me which one you think is the fate that befell the ship, or if you have your own theory based on your own research. I'd love to know. First up is the most widely accepted theory today, the idea that she was struck by a rogue wave. This is by far the most widely accepted explanation for the disappearance of the Waratah. Rogue waves, also known as freak waves, are common in that area of the ocean south of Africa. The theory goes that during the storm, while already dealing with stability issues, the Waratah was struck by a massive wave. And these can sneak up on you and literally come out of nowhere, which is what makes them so scary. The wave would have either rolled the ship all the way over or flooded her hold and pulled the ship underwater and sank it a mere seconds after being swamped. If the ship capsized quickly, it's possible that any buoyant debris would have been trapped below her and sank with her, hence why there is no wreckage anywhere that was found, either washed ashore on a beach or drifting out in the ocean. Now, as an expansion of the rogue wave idea, we have my favorite theory. Not the one I believe, but my favorite. And that is... That the, that the Waratah became stranded in Antarctica. This theory goes that she was struck by a rogue wave, but didn't sink. Instead, she, her rudder was damaged or she was otherwise disabled, and the ship began to drift. Taken by the current, she was then pulled south and either sank somewhere way south of Africa, or ran aground in or sank off the coast of Antarctica. Now, there is no evidence for this, save the fact that no wreck of the ship has been found anywhere in the region she is expected to be in if she had sunk. And remember, the ship had no wireless set. So if she did become disabled and drifted south, then she'd have no way to call for help. So, just something to keep in mind. Also, also fun fact that relates to this. In 1913, the Daily Mail thought that their competitor, the Daily Standard, was copying them. So they printed a false story about the Waratah being found in Antarctica. And the Daily Standard fell right for it and printed the same story too. Anyway, the theory basically says that she's run aground somewhere or sunk in Antarctica after drifting there following a strike from a rogue wave and simply hasn't been found. It'd be very cool if it turned out she's just been sitting on a beach in Antarctica somewhere all this time. Moving on, here are some other ideas that are being tossed around. The next most popular one seems to be the idea of a cargo shift. During the voyage which she disappeared on, Warta was carrying a cargo of 1,000 tons of lead, as well as an additional 300 tons of lead or concentrate. The thing about that is that lead or concentrate is known to, in certain conditions, liquefy due to the motion of a ship. Yeah, 
that'll throw your ship off balance. And as we've established, Wartal left something to be desired when it came to her stability in good conditions. Basically, if lead ore concentrate liquefies, it can throw a ship off balance and cause it to capsize. Today, we understand that lead ore concentrate is a hazardous cargo, and when ships transport it, there are safety precautions put in place to protect the ship and crew. Not back then, though. They didn't know this. There was basically no awareness about this issue. So, this is certainly possible in bad weather with an already unstable ship. I could definitely see this causing the Wartaw to capsize. So, like the Rogave idea, this one is definitely possible. Another theory is that the Wartaw was caught in a massive whirlpool. Now, we're getting into theories here that aren't as widely accepted, so keep that in mind. These aren't quite as sound as the first ones. This one has been tossed around since the ship originally disappeared and continues to get brought up to this day. And it says that the Waratah was caught in a whirlpool created by a combination of winds and the weather at the time as a whole, currents, and a deep ocean trench. And there are a lot of those in that area. They are kind of common in that region off the southern coastline of Africa. While this theory does explain the lack of wreckage, no evidence today supports the idea a whirlpool could be created with a strong enough force, basically, to suck down such a big ship. Remember, she was 450 feet long with a beam of 59 feet 4 inches. No whirlpool today is believed to have the strength to suck something so big down almost instantly. Another theory is that the ship exploded. This theory comes from one of the possible sightings I covered earlier, specifically the Harlow sighting. Remember, the running lights on the unidentified steamer vanished after those two bright flashes of light. This theory goes that the Waratah was obliterated in a sudden explosion within one of her coal bunkers. However, no explosion like this could make a ship as big as the Waratah sink instantly, especially without leaving any wreckage. So, this theory also seems pretty unlikely to me. In all honesty, I'd rank these theories as most likely to least likely in the order we just covered them. Tell me what you think, though. SS Waratah and her story captivates me, and I can't express how much I wish she'd be found. I understand completely how someone like Emlyn Brown could spend 20 years trying to find her. This story captivates you and just sucks you in and doesn't let go. I, I think it's the unsolved nature of it. It's like the Warta itself is calling out, pleading for someone to come find her. And the big question, which theory do I buy about her fate? I love the Antarctica one, but I think the Rogue Wave makes the most sense. The only weird thing is that there were no debris to be found. That's strange. I can't see all the debris being trapped under the ship if it got struck by a wave. But Waratah is somewhere. But the fact that it vanished so utterly is unnerving. It's just gone, and so was everyone who was on board her. You know, I get it. This happened over a century ago, and it's hard to sometimes personally relate to stuff that happened so long ago that we are so removed from. But these were people, human beings, alive and as unique as any of us today. And they just vanished utterly. What happened to them? For a lot of people today, their great-grandparents or even grandparents were alive when this ship vanished. A century really isn't that long ago. I think it's important to remember that. And you know, the Waratah has kind of fallen into obscurity, maybe in part to the sinking of the Titanic in 1912, but the Titanic was almost in the same exact situation. The Marconi wireless set on the Titanic broke during the voyage, and Phillips and Bride disregarded protocol and fixed the set. If they hadn't, no one would have heard the Titanic's SOS. And today, we probably would not know what happened to the Titanic either. Titanic would probably be as mysterious of a mystery as the Waratah is if that had happened. 
Now, I've danced around it a lot, but what do I think? What is my theory? Again, I think the most likely thing is a rogue wave. The fact that the ship was unsteady in calm weather supports this. An unstable ship, rough water, a bad storm, and a giant wave just sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. And the ocean is big. It could have happened anywhere. And it's so much space to look through that it's probably impossible to find the ship unless you search every inch of its route and then some outside of that. Though... I do love the idea of the ship drifting down and running aground in Antarctica. I think that could make a really cool speculative history movie or novel. The ship being hit by a wave but not fully capsizing and then drifting south where everyone tries to survive and think of a way to get help. Imagine finding it there one day. Run aground and coated in ice on a beach somewhere. I love that theory, but I don't think it's the one I buy. So with all that build up... My theory on the fate of the Warata is this. She was struck by a rogue wave sometime on July 28, 1909, after being sighted by the liner Gilf. Following this, she was either capsized or partially capsized, and drifted south of her planned route for a time, caught in an ocean current before actually going down. Any debris were swept south or maybe even east into the Indian Ocean, hence why they were never found. How long the Warata might have drifted is up for debate, but it might have drifted for miles, hours, even days before going under. The rough sea had likely shifted the Warata off its planned route slightly as well before the disaster even occurred. But I believe the wreck is somewhere further south, maybe southeast of the region of her route she'd have been on on the 28th. Specifically, it lies closer to Africa than Antarctica, because the further off course she ended up, the harder to find she'd be. I doubt she reached Antarctica, but with the total unknown factor of how long she could have drifted, we can't exactly narrow down the region. She might have sunk right away, or drifted for weeks. Of course, that might be wrong, and she could be much closer to her, to her planned route than we think. For all, for all we know, one of the searches might, looking for her might have passed within a few hundred feet of her and just missed her. Maybe she's nestled down in a trench or in a hole and wasn't picked up on sonar. Hopefully one day the wreck will be found and we will finally get answers. Even after all this time, Warta could still tell her story if we could only find her wreck. But until then, I believe she was struck by a rogue wave and she either sank right away or she drifted south to southeast for a while before going down. Alright, the mystery is over. Now I'm just going to ramble for a few minutes about this story and this whole project. The story of the Warata has captivated me. Just like the Titanic captivates me and many other people. And I wanted to make this remastered version of the original video. Not just for the anniversary of the disappearance, but I also wanted to do it a little better than I did before. I was still new at making this kind of video when I made the original version and it shows. I tweaked the script in a few places and obviously added more pictures, but I'm also human. I got a few facts wrong in the original that I've corrected here. I'm so enamored with this story, and I hope one day we find the wreck. And I just wanted to do it, and the story, justice. Uh, I'm beginning to sound like a broken record because in my paleo documentaries I've talked about how much I hope we find more fossils of some of the animals I've talked about, like Chrysopithecus and Auroran, but oh well. I hope we find the Warata one day. Warta isn't the only story like this that I've covered either. I did a whole series on ships that vanished from hundreds of years ago to only a few years ago. All stories that should be told. Please look up some of these stories and read them. Or watch my videos telling their stories to you. Don't let them be forgotten. The internet has given us access to so much knowledge. And please, take some time and just look up some of these ships and the people who were on them. And remember... Warata's lesser-known sister also sank. She had a collision in the Mediterranean. Warata and her sister, gone just like that. Geelong couldn't find her little sister. And then she too was lost to the ocean. Albeit in a much less mysterious way. But in the end, the ocean took them both. And like I said earlier, keep in mind that 1909 was not that long ago. People are still alive today... Who knew people alive in 1909? Heck, there's probably still a few people alive who were alive in 1909. It wasn't that long ago. And Warata is still out there, somewhere, waiting to be found. 
I hope someone does one day. I hope one day the war talk can be found. And if she is, that she's resting peacefully. I hope finding her, showing her that she hasn't been forgotten, and the people that they haven't been forgotten, gives her peace, and the people peace. Because I can't be the only one who thinks that sometimes things like shipwrecks or abandoned houses look sad and lonely. Shadows of what they once were, kind of like a restless spirit. I think finding them and showing them that they're remembered makes them seem a little more peaceful. Like a little spark of their old majesty comes back. Maybe that's just me. It's a nice thought. I hope that she and her passengers who vanished with her are all resting peacefully wherever they may be now. So with all that said, I'm going to wrap this up. That was the story of the disappearance of the Waratah. The ocean is a place of stories and some of the greatest mysteries of all time. And now you know the story of the Waratah and it is just one of those mysteries. The tip of a very large iceberg. Waratah is not even a drop in the bucket of stories. And we've explored several others since my original version of this video. I'll let you ponder that. The sheer number of mysteries the ocean hides in its depths. And I'll sign off for now. I love mysteries, and I love old ships, and when those two things come together, I'm hooked, line, sinker, and all. Tell me what you think happened to the Waratah. Do you think she's a wreck on the bottom of the ocean off the southern coast of Africa in a place no one has looked? Maybe south of her route somewhere? Do you think she exploded? Or do you think she drifted south and now rests somewhere on the coastline of Antarctica? I think I like that theory because... It's not only this grand idea of a final voyage that you can write a great fictional story around, but also because if she was found resting in shallow water and not sunk, she might still be in decent shape and we might get answers. I just like this idea for a specific reason. Because if she did drift into Antarctica and ran aground off on the coast and is still above water... There's just, she'd still be on that beach or in that bay. And there's just an appealing feeling that comes with the idea of one of these grand old steamships still being out there and existing today, preserved when most have long since been scrapped and now only exist in paintings of a bygone age. It's a cool idea, and I think it would be rather fitting if Waratah, the one who vanished, was revealed to be the one that actually survived all this time when the others were scrapped. It would be such a beautiful and poetic end to this story. However, as much as I like that theory, I don't think it is true. I agree that she was probably swamped by a rogue wave and no one has looked in the right spot to find the wreck. She might be hundreds of miles south of Africa for all we know, especially if she was struck by a wave but drifted for days or even weeks before going down. Tell me your idea though, I'd love to know. So thank you for watching. I hope you found the mystery interesting. I hope you enjoyed the video. And I hope you learned something. And I hope you took something away from this fascinating story. The story of the Waratah is so captivating. And it just really makes you wonder what happened. Your imagination can picture any story. Of a rapid sinking with people trapped inside the ship. Or a desperate fight for survival as they drift further and further south towards Antarctica. And I hope you see why now. I wanted to remaster this video in particular because I wanted to do the story justice and fix a few errors I had in the original, and add a few extra details I left out of the original to make sure it was done justice. Again, thank you for watching, check out my other documentaries, and until the next one, that's all for now. Have a good one, everybody.